הנה, אנחנו התחלנו. אוקיי, בסדר. So now... Rabbi Sussman, can I just make yeah. a, a quick announcement? Sure. Uh, everybody should have gotten an email, but this will be our last, just to reiterate, this is our last uh, session, at least for the summer. Uh, unfortunately, our uh, request for solicitation for funds was about a month ago, was less than overwhelming. And uh, so we, uh, our intent to continue through the summer, uh, we were not able to do. And we will pick up uh, Mir Sashem on September the 10th. Uh, and I don't know, the way it's looking now, it'll probably be Zoom. I'm not, but uh, we'll see if we can uh, get back in person or not. But uh, uh, to be honest, it's not looking that way. But uh, we'll see what happens in September. Okay. All right. Um, the center. Okay, so um, because it is the last uh, session, um, of the, well, it was going to be the last session in any event before Tisha B'Av, um, and our last session until, um, until September. So I thought I would do something a little bit differently than what I normally do. Um, I normally um, focus more on halachic issues. In fact, the, the title for the, the course is uh, Parshut HaShavua. Um, but today I thought I would uh, uh, focus a little bit more uh, with Tisha B'Av coming around to discuss a little bit more on a philosophical level um, how different thoughts in Chazal specifically with regard to the uh, background of the Churban and of course for the ramifications for us in our, in our quest to rebuild the Beit HaMikdash uh, to take a look at different, uh, different uh, ideas. Some of them um, are familiar, I'm sure, and I Hopefully, we'll put some twist into those as well, and some of them are less familiar. But to take a, a look at um, different ideas, and with that, I want to start with a uh, fair, very uh, every. You know, I I like to say that whenever I say something is is famous, that means that I know it. Um, if I say something is very famous, then I think that it's something that other people usually know as well. So this is a very famous uh, piece of Gemara, but what's less famous here is the, the background for the Gemara. The Gemara itself is in, um, and we're not going to start with the Gemara, the Gemara is in Yoma, uh, on the left hand of your table. So I put the Gemara along with the uh, translation. Um, I think that's the Sansino translation that I have, uh, not the more modern um, Koran translation. Um, but, the, uh, but we'll get to that. If you want, while I'm speaking, you want to skim it, you can do that. But first I want to take a look at the source for the Gemara itself. And you'll see very clearly how this is the source for the Gemara. The Gemara quotes a Brita, um, and this is a the uh, it's a Brita which is found in the Tosefta in Menachot. That's on the right side of the screen here. Um, and I want to take a look at that Tosefta and see how it is transformed first in the Yerushalmi. That's the second column to the right, and then in the Bavli. Um, and different, just in the same source, the way that it is interpreted in different approaches in Chazal, you see already different ideas that are going to come up. And then we'll use this as a little bit of a, um, perhaps a springboard for other things um, as we go along. So let's start with the, the Brighton. The Brighton says the following, Amar Rabbi Yochanan ben Turta. Rabbi Yochanan ben Turta said, Mipnei machar v'ashilal. Why did, why was Shiloh destroyed? Now, before we go any further, skip to the next paragraph. Then the next question is, well, before we get to the answer, Yerushalayim binyan harishon mipnei macharva. Right, so that's over here, right? The, uh, that this, um, that the Yerushalayim, the first, um, the first Beit HaMikdash, the first binyan, why was that destroyed? And then we have the third paragraph is Ba'achrona, right? The, the third, uh, the, it doesn't even call it the, the second Beit HaMikdash, but it refers to it as the last Beit HaMikdash. Okay, so the, the Brita is taking a look at three different destructions that befell the Jewish people from the time that they had a Mishkan, and the Brighton wants to try to figure out what is the cause for each of these destructions. 
So the first, the first back of the Shiloh, Mipnei Macharva Shiloh, why was Shiloh destroyed? So the answer given is straightforward, Mipnei Bizayon Kodshim Shvetocha. The reason is very simple, because the korbanot that were being brought were being disgraced. Okay, the, there was a um, there was something um, inherently flawed with the avoda in the mishkan itself. Now, the the brayta is of course working off of the um, perak in Shmuel. I'll just to go down to the bottom of the the sheet. I just sort of put it as an appendix. Actually, this morning before the uh, before the shear, um, something that now that I don't have to worry about uh, paper. So I uh, decided just to do that here. But to take a look at the um, the Perak Bet in Shmuel Aleph. And after the story of Chana and the birth of Shmuel, the Navi switches to what is going on in the Mishkan in Shiloh at that time, where Shmuel finds himself as an apprentice to uh, Eli. Um, and this is, of course, going to lead to Peragimel, where Shmuel is, um, becomes a Navi for the first time um, when he is um, asleep um, in the complex in Shiloh. Um, and he receives his first Nebuah, and the Nebuah is that Shiloh will be destroyed. That's the first Nebuah of Shmuel. Um, and here, the, um, this is what the background is. Bnei Eli, Bnei Bliyayl. The sons of Eli, and Eli was, of course, the Kohen Gadol, a, um, who are now, we'll take the translation, they were scoundrels. And, and they did not pay, they paid no heed to Hashem. So this was the law of the Kohanim. So by calling this Mishpat, right, so basically we're saying, or the Navi is saying, that this is standard practice in the Mikdash. Anyone brings a sacrifice, a young Kohen comes, and with a three-pronged fork, and um, while the meat is cooking. So he takes this fork, and it's a, you know, it's a large fork, that we're talking about, it's not a small fork, and he takes, um, he bangs the, the pot or whatever the um, korban is being cooked in. So the, basically, there's a, you know, the, the kohen goes to, from, from family to family and taking whatever meat that um, the kohen wants. Gam b'terem yikteron et achelav. Before the um, the fat was the basically the, the the parts of the korban that had to go onto the mizbeach before they were to even to be burnt. Uvanar kohen va'amar leisha zovech tna basar litzlot la kohen velo yikach mimcha basar mevashel ki imuchai. Right. So the basically the kohanim were. Abusing their power, taking the 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 the, kor, the korban, or taking their share of the korban, or beyond their share of the korban, I should say, before it had even made it to the mizbeach, and then by yomer the um, this is the um, uh, so this is part and parcel of it. People complain that's pasuk tetzayin, but. The um, they would take it nevertheless by force. Pasuk Yudzayin, Vati Chatata Na Orim Gedolam Maod Et Pnei Hashem Ki Niatzu Hashanashim Et Minchat Hashem. So the um, this the Davi says is a very great sin for they have basically are Mechalel the Korbanot. No, they're taking the um, they, they're taking the the Korbanot. So on a on one level. They're taking their share before the before God gets His share, as it were. But they are, perhaps even more importantly, and this is, uh, or at least as importantly, 
they're corrupting the entire process. In other words, this is now, that's the, 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 the um, I think the purpose of Pasuk Tetzayin um, to be brought here, where, it's, where they take it by force. You know, as the idea is, is that they are cheapening the entire avodah in the eyes of the people. And this is exactly what um, the Pasuk Habet, um, I skip a few Pesukim, because it deals more with Shmuel than with this. Ve'eli zaken ma'od. So Eli was very old, and meaning that he basically had lost control, but he heard nevertheless what his sons were doing, and not only were they um, violating, if you will, the sanctity of the Korbanot, but they were yishkavun et anashim atzovot petach oel moed. So they um, basically um, also uh, abused their status as Kohanim um, to sexually abuse the, uh, um, the women who would be coming to the Mishkan. Now the Gemara in Shabbat, though some of you may be familiar with, uh, tries to say that this Pasuk shouldn't be taken literally. Regardless, the idea that the, this is how it's being presented as the, uh, by the Navi um, is, uh, is very important. So this is all that the, what the Tosefta, to go back to the beginning of our, um, of the sheet, um, that's what the Tosefta is referring to. Was, why was Shiloh destroyed? This is very simple. This is why Shiloh was destroyed. And the last Pasuk, actually, I, I should have uh, read that last Pasuk that I put on the, the, uh, on the, on the sheet, is that Eli says the same thing to, to his sons. So if a man sins against man, so then you can, here it says the Lord may pardon him. It means that you can pray to Hashem, you can try to make amends. But if you sin to God, who exactly are you going to turn to? Well, that's basically the, the message of the Navi, and that's what the Tosefta says very simply. That why was Shiloh destroyed? Because the avodah in the Mishkan itself had been corrupted. Based on that, the, uh, the Tosefta continues, Yerushalayim binyan Rishon mitnei macharva. Right, so why was the first Beit HaMikdash then destroyed? Now, there's no indication in the Navi, certainly not as a major theme, that the, um, the avodah in the ritual avodah in the Mishkan was undermined. And so, uh, excuse me, in, in the Beit HaMikdash Rishon, the first Beit HaMikdash, there's no indication that there, the, 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 the rituals that were going on was, uh, were being defiled by the Kohanim. I understand, basically, the Tosefta says why Shiloh should be destroyed. Why should the first Beit HaMikdash be destroyed if everything is fine inside the confines of the Beit HaMikdash? And the answer that um, that, uh, that the Tosefta gives is because Why? Because of Avodah Zarah, Gilui Arayot, and the um, and murder that was there. Now, just to give you a sense of this, this uh, you, it's, 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 I find it uh, fascinating that the Tosefta basically is working off of the, uh, the Psukim in the, uh, in the in, in the Navi. If you go down here now to the, to the end of the sheet, to the, uh, to this, to the appendix here of a, of a perik that I took from Yirmiyahu. So Yirmiyahu says the following. So this is what Yirmiyahu is being told by Hashem to talk to the people and say. This is what you're supposed to say. You're standing in the, in, in the shar of the Beit HaMikdash. This is what you should be and what you should be telling. People are coming, going back and forth at the gate of the Beit HaMikdash. This is what you should be telling them. So if you fix your ways, I will dwell in this place. But al tiftechu lachem el divrei ha-sheker lemor hechal Hashem, hechal Hashem, hechal Hashem hema. Do not rely 
on the words and delusions that say, this is the temple of Hashem, three times, over and over and over. In other words, you don't have to worry about anything because the Beit HaMikdash will protect you. Whereas if you treat people properly and you don't murder and you don't worship Avodah Zarah in this, um, uh, it doesn't even say in this place. In other words, it sounds as though the inequities when it comes to Ben Adam L'Chaveiro are being perhaps committed inside the confines of the Beit HaMikdash, but the Avodah Zarah is not necessarily in the Beit HaMikdash, it's outside the Beit HaMikdash. When it's a, you know, we're familiar with the geography, the topography. So if you talk about the, uh, the, the site for Molech worship, so that was in Gei Ben Hinom, where the Cinematheque is today, right? So there are those who want to compare the Cinematheque to Gei Ben Hinom, to Avodat Molech, but that's another, that's another discussion. But the point though is, is that that's outside the confines. It's very close to the Beit HaMikdash, right? Now as you're walking, well, you know, you, it's a, a five minute walk, 10 minute walk from Har Habayit to where Molech is being worshiped and children are being slaughtered for, um, for, the, for the Molech. But they're not necessarily in the same confines. And what Yirmiya was saying, which for us might be um, obvious, but that's because we've been brought up on these ideas, but it wasn't obvious at all to the people who are um, living then, is that the Beit HaMikdash will not protect you if you are doing the wrong things outside of the Beit HaMikdash. And the Navi, after saying that if you bend your way, I will, um, the, I will then dwell because you are, here you have the, uh, Take a look at this, this last passage. Right? You are relying on these illusions which are of no avail. You steal, you murder, you commit adultery. Here in this pasuk, pasuk te, you have basically the three averot. And um, uh, the uh, uh, Anavodazara. So these are being stated explicitly in the uh, Pasuk in Yirmiyahu. And then you come, Words, this, the, the Navi here is basically um, predating the Godfather scenes, right? Those scenes in the, uh, in the Godfather movies where you have all of the mafia hits being juxtaposed with Lahavdil, the scenes in church, right? So that's what's going on here too. You have Pasuk Tet, are all of the uh, terrible Averot of the, um, that are going on outside of the Beit HaMikdash. And then you come into Shul, you come into the Beit HaMikdash and everything is fine, right? That's what you believe, that is the illusion. But that, and in fact, you've turned the uh, the Navi says, "Hamarat pratzim I have by tazesh nikrashi mi alav beinechem gam anochi and iraiti nu mashem." You have turned my Beit Hamikdash into a den of thieves, not because anything is happening inside the Beit Hamikdash. Everything inside the Beit Hamikdash is fine, but if everything outside the Beit Hamikdash is wrong, so then in effect the Beit Hamikdash has become a den of thieves. And the Navi draws at the very last pasuk that I brought here the direct comparison to Shiloh. Words, go and see what happened in Shiloh. It was basically saying, you think that in Shiloh they corrupted the Avodah, and that's why Shiloh was destroyed. That's true. But just because you're corrupting Jewish life outside of the Beit HaMikdash doesn't mean the Beit HaMikdash is going to protect you. The Beit HaMikdash here will become just like Shiloh. So exactly what the Tosefta says is already found um, explicitly in this Perak in Yirmiyahu. And then the Tosefta finishes with perhaps the most famous part of this. Right? So now we have the last. So we are, in other words, basically there is a progression. 
in each in each of the um, eras that we're speaking about, first in Shiloh, then by it Rishon, then by it Sheni. So each subsequent period cleans up the act of the previous. Was in in Bayit Rishon, was they got it wrong in Shiloh because they corrupted the Avodah and they made it into something which was a mockery in the eyes of the people. Think of the again Lahavdil, let's say the, uh, the, the the Protestant Reformation. So it takes the the idea of the um, the the beta of the Mishkan and turns it into something which is abhorrent in the eyes of Am Yisrael. So that's why there's no place for it anymore. It's destroyed. We fix that in Bayit Rishon. Now people look at Bayit Rishon as the place to come for Avodah. They bifurcate. And that is also not the correct approach. And that's why Bayit Rishon is destroyed. So now we come to Bayit Sheni. And Bayit Sheni, we fix the problem of Bayit Rishon. Makirin Anu Bahem. The Tosefta, writing this now about 150 or so years after the Korban. So the Tosefta says, we know these people. These are our great, great, great grandparents, right? And perhaps the Tosefta is, be, is, is an oral tradition from immediately after the Churban. We know the type of people who lived here. They were amelin b'Torah, zihirin b'Maasrot. They are very, they were scrupulous about learning Torah. They gave Maasrot. Perhaps that's saying in terms of staka. We're going to see how this is transformed a little bit in subsequent versions. Mipnei Magalu, why were they, why did the exile strike them? Was if everything is fine outside of the Beit HaMikdash, why should there have been a Chorban? Mipnei She'ohavin et hamamon v'sonin ish et reyehu. So the reason is, and here we have, note the term is the, um, the term here of, of, of Sinat Chinam has not yet been introduced. But we have because a, a definition of it, which is they loved money and they hated each other. So the, the, to teach you that God despises sinat chinam, and this is why the, um, the, 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 and it's compared to Avodah Zarah Gilui Areot Shvichut So as I said, this is a very famous uh, idea. We'll see how the more famous piece in the, in, in the, uh, in the Gemara and Yoma in a minute. But you see in its core, the, the way that the idea that the Tosefta wanted to, to, uh, to, to the idea that Tosefta wanted to get across is that you have this kind of, um, this, this kind of uh, progression, I guess you could call it, where you are correcting certain of a wrote and you think that by correcting them that everything is fine. And the answer is that everything is not fine. Okay, that is the, the idea that you have Sinat Chinam and Sinat Chinam, the, the punchline is that Sinat Chinam is as bad or has as much destructive power as the, um, the other um, the other Avera. Now, the, um, just to, to take a quick look at the, um, how this develops, right? So you have going across the, um, the, um, the, we have the Brita, which says um, in the Yushami, I won't look at it right now, but the Yushami has a little bit of an introduction. We're in the second column here. Rabbi Yochanan ben Turta Amar Matan Shalok Harba Shilo Ela Shayu Mevazim Et Hamoadot Mechalim Et Hakodshim. We have so the Shilo is the same. Matzanu, um, except here the uh, with a little more detail. The um, if we'll go across to you know what we'll go across to the Bavli at the same time just to see here we add a specific claim Mevazim Et Hamoadot. Right, it's now not just the Kodshim that is added, but also that the, um, you have a, uh, the, the holidays are being, um, are being uh, undermined, that they are being corrupted, and the reason is, is because the, this is the idea, the, the, the people who are coming, 
they came on specific times. So their, uh, um, their if you will, their religious experience um, is being destroyed by the Kohanim. And in the Babli, it's a little more explicit. varim gilui arayot uvizayon kodshim. Now, the um, the mivazim et hamawadot could be a um, a euphemism, because the 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 women who the bnei eli were referring to that uh, the the navi says that they um, that they laid with sheish kavunatan. So they it talks about the nashim um, hamawadot. That's the uh, the term that was used here. Just to go back to that, um, the um, uh, uh, excuse me, it's so both um, at Petach Ol Moed. They came to the Ol Moed. The Moadim is when they came, and that's how they were being. Um, it was being uh, uh, defiled. However, um, in the Babli, it's it's more explicit. Be that as it may. So now we still have the same idea of in terms of Bayit Rishon, um, and we have the the three ideas that we've seen. That doesn't change from one. Um, version to the next. However, we now have um, in the Yerushalmi um, a couple of uh, twists on the other idea. You have the um, here the uh, there's a um, a longer expression of the virtues of um, Bayit Sheni. Yigin b'Torah zehirin b'Mitzvot u'Maasrot v'Chol Veset Tova Haita Bahen. Okay, here it's the Yerushalmi, and the Yerushalmi, just in terms of um, chronology, is about um, about 100, the, the end of the Yerushalmi is about 150 or so years after the Tosefta, and it's saying the following, they were, it's now not just that they were learning Torah and they were careful with Ma'asrot, but that they also did everything that could be good. They were chock full of mitzvot. But the, the Avera here is again, Now, the, um, the idea of sinat chinam, right, is now introduced for the first time. The term sinat chinam is, uh, is introduced for the first time. Now, it seems to be that the definition of sinat chinam is... In, and this is an important question. What does Sinat Chinam mean? I mean, if, uh, you know, you're, you're muted. If you unmute yourselves, how would you define Sinat Chinam? You've all heard the term, right? What does Sinat Chinam mean? Could you unmute yourselves? No, no possibility of, 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 of unmuting. Okay, so then I guess the uh, you, uh, I'm not the the host, so I can't unmute you. Um, okay, so I'll have to say, generally speaking, I don't know. People give different definitions. You know, if the um, one second uh, if, uh, of of sinat chinam. So we're going to take a look at it here. What the idea of sinat chinam seems to be the following just in the, in the context, is that people love money because you're getting something out of it. Sinat chinam is in opposition to ahavat mamon, or it's the, the hatred that you have for people is in order to further your, um, uh, your, your financial gain. That's the, um, right? We say, hey, someone, uh, Norm put it, Hatred without a cause. What does that mean, hatred without a cause? When was the last time you hated someone without a cause? Right? You know, you just walk over to a person on the side of the street and punch them in the face for no reason. Right? Uh, we don't do that. That doesn't, that doesn't jive with the idea of kol veset tova haitabahen. The idea of sinat chinam, at least as it's being presented here, seems to be um, that... Okay, so Stephen says that it's more than is necessary, whatever that, you know, exactly how much is necessary. Um, the idea that is here again is that it's, it's straightforward. I have, um, I have a, a, a motive. I love my money. I want to gain money. And I will stop people who, will, um, who are standing in my way. 
that's the sinat chinam, because there you're doing it without the, the it's as opposed to the money. Um, the, uh, the, then the Yerushalmi finishes by having said that with something which didn't ex- uh, appear in the Tosefta, and that is Reb Zerav, Reb Yaakov, Bar Acha, Reb Avuna, Havin Yatvin, Amrin Biyoter Shebirishon, Nivne Uvesheni, Lo Nivne. In other words, until now, the Tosefta, remember, the Tosefta was being written um, after a, um, a, a time where, roughly uh, speaking, the, um, it was a little bit after the, the Bar Kokhba rebellion. And for, as I said, perhaps the original um, Rav Yochanan ben Turta is a, I should have said this at the outside, Rav Yochanan ben Turta is a person who is a contemporary of Rabbi Akiva. And as a contemporary of Rabbi Akiva, it means that he himself may have um, witnessed the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash. And if he didn't, he's one generation afterwards. And he is a, um, a he lives during the time of Bar Kokhba, which is approximately 70 years, a little bit less, 65 years, but se- probably 70 years after the destruction of the second Beit HaMikdash. So Rabbi Yochanan ben Torta, when he originally made the statement, was looking back and saying, basically, okay, perhaps we are at the cusp of a new, um, uh, of a new binyan. Uh, there's a, another Gemara, which I didn't bring here, but the Gemara talks about how Rabbi Akiva tells Rabbi Yochanan ben Torta that basically Bar Kokhba is the Mashiach, and Rabbi Yochanan ben Torta looks at Rabbi Akiva and says, grass will grow from your cheeks which is the, um, the Chazal equivalent of saying you're going to be pushing up the daisies and the Mashiach will still not have arrived. But basically, Rabbi Yochanan ben Turta isn't say, can't say yet that the, first, uh, that the second Galut is worse than the first. The Yerushalmi is being written about uh, 250, 300 years after the Chorban, that's when it's being. Uh, that's when it's being finished, and so the Rishalmi can say that the second Khurban, Sinat Chinam is worse than the first three Averot because, after all, um, the first the Khurban lasted seventy years. The second Khurban is now uh, going on two hundred, three hundred years. Right? It doesn't have to reach the, the two thousand years that we're familiar with, but just the two hundred, three hundred years. So you see, Sinat Chinam is worse than the idea. However, the basic idea of Sinat Chinam as the definition, that hasn't changed from the, from the Tosefta. However, in the, um, if you take a look at the Yerusha, the Bavli, right, the Bavli is a little bit later and we're now switched to Bavel, right? So we're no longer in Eretz Yisrael. It's a different uh, perspective. The Siyum of the, of the Bavli is generally understood to be in the fifth century. And so here, what happens 400 years or so after the, uh, the, the Chorban? We're saying, Mikdash Sheni Shayu Oskim B'Torah Mitzvot Gminut Chasadim Mipnei Macharev Mipnei Shaita Bo Sinat Chinam And that, so now we have, the, we've taken out this Ohavin et HaMamon, this Sonin Elu et Elu, right? That is no longer found. Um, in the uh, in the in the in the Bible. here it's just sinat chinam uh, as sinat chinam period, right? It's a it's it's understood, okay? What is but now the Gemara asks something which is new. Uve mikdash we shown lo have be sinat chinam. What it wasn't sinat chinam in the first Beit Hamikdash. So this is something which is totally new in the Bible, which didn't exist. This question and what does the Bible say? Vaktiv. So cry out and wail, son of man, for it will come against my people, against all the princes of Israel, an assemblage of swords came against my people. Therefore clap hands against thy. So this is the pasuk, which is understood to be the definition of sinat china. The Babli gives us a definition of sinat china. What is the Babli's definition? Amar Rebbe Lazar. Elu bnei adam sheochlin b'shotin ze in ze v'dokrin ze et ze b'charavot shel b'shona. 
whoops, sorry about that. The, um, the uh, what is that? The um, diplomacy. <laughs> if there's no better term, right? If I had to sum up Rebbe Lezer in one word, it's diplomacy. What is it? Refers to people who socialize together and stab one another with their razor sharp tongues. In other words, basically, um, someone once referred this to me as called this, not, not referring to this Gemara, but talked to me about, um, he was talking about a specific uh, city in the Midwest. I'll leave that city uh, un, uh, un, untouched right now. I'll just simply say Midwest nice. Right? If you, you people, you go over to people and you know, they, they say if, if, if um, and the, the Brits in the crowd will tell, you know, tell me if I'm wrong, please put it on the chat. If you, um, if someone tells you that was brilliant, right? If I, you know, if, uh, after a shear or, uh, or a drusha, brilliant rabbi, brilliant. So you know that things are being said behind your back. Right? I know the, the praise is there. That's she'ochlin v'shotin ze'edzeh v'dokrin ze'edzeh b'charavot she'lishonah. But they are skewering each other with their razor-sharp tongues. That's the definition of, um, of sinaf chinam. And the Gemara says, one second, we know that this existed in the time of Bayit Rishon too. So why are you telling me that sinaf chinam wasn't, um, wasn't, uh, wasn't a, fe a feature of Bayit Rishon life? And yet Bayit Rishon, they already did have the, the geula. They had the rebuilding of the Beit HaMikdash. So why don't we have the rebuilding of the Beit HaMikdash? So the Gemara's answer is a very interesting one. Hayhi b'nisiyei Yisrael havai. Dichtiv za'ak v'ilel ben adam ki yaita ba'ami v'tanya za'ak v'ilel ben adam yachol akol tamud lomar hi b'chol nisiyei Yisrael. Since the, who were the, the people who were uh, involved in the, uh, in the, um, in what the Babli is defining as Sinat Chinam, Nisiye Yisrael. In other words, as long as it was in the aristocracy, as long as it was in the elite. So that wasn't a systemic problem, the Gemara is saying, that would have caused the Chorban. What caused the Chorban was the fact that the entire uh, people, the entirety of Am Yisrael, were engaged in the uh, and but as long as it was just the Sinat Chinam was limited to the aristocracy, so that wouldn't have destroyed the Beit HaMikdash. The ruling class would not have destroyed the Beit HaMikdash. But the fact that it, other Averot had seeped into the Am, that did. Whereas in Bayit Sheni and by extension today, the Gemara is saying, because after all, the Beit HaMikdash hasn't been rebuilt. So the reason why we are still suffering is because this idea of sinat chinam, and again, we, the Gemara gives a very nice definition for what sinat chinam is. Sinat chinam doesn't mean a without rationale. What it means is without um, without context. In other words, without a um, a it becomes something which is uh, so um, widespread and uh, deeply entrenched in people's uh, behavior, they don't even notice it anymore. That the people that, you're, uh, that you are dining with, meaning that these are your friends, that you are going to, um, you're going to smirch them behind their backs, you're going to work against their interests behind their backs, that's what Sinat Chinam is. In other words, that's basically the idea, that people, the, the, there's a basic distrust in, um, in, uh, in society that has permeated into every level of society. That's the definition of sinat chinam that the Bavli is given. Um, I'll just, um, before I want to, I want to take, jump to another uh, Gemara, which many of you are familiar with, and just one minute, but before I do that, I want to take a look at um, just an idea that the Ramban says with regard to, you know what, I'm not even going to talk about the the the, um, the 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 Ramban because of time constraints. I want to look at the the Kamsa Bar Kamsa Gemara in a little bit uh, in depth, but I just want to take a look at the um, at source number five here, the Ha'amek Davar, the, uh, the this is the Nitziv, 
um, in his introduction to Sefer Bereshit. So of course, we are now really jumping ahead. We've gone from the Tosefta with Rabbi Yochanan ben Turta, who had been speaking just a, in the generation after the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash, to the Yerushalmi, which is a couple hundred years after that, and then to the Bavli, which is another hundred years, and we've seen a transformation. The first, the, the Tosefta hasn't spoken about, didn't, never used the term Sinat Chinam, just uses the idea that people put their own interests ahead of other people. That's, the, that's enough. Ohavine tamamon v'sonin et chaverim. That's the idea. Okay? The, um, the Yushami calls that um, sinat chinam. That's the definition of where sinat chinam becomes. And the, to the best of my knowledge, the first place where the term sinat chinam is being used is in that Yerushalmi. The, and the third place, you have, a hundred years later, you have a new definition. It's not clear exactly why the, uh, to me at least, I'm, I'm not sure why the Bavli uh, switched and didn't accept the definition, the original definition of Rabbi Yochanan ben Turta. And to say that there there are people working against each other's interests, perhaps they felt that the term sinat chinam didn't accomplish that enough. And the Gemara, um, by you know, basically they took this idea sinat chinam and they said it can't mean oh abine tamamon v'sonin et chaveru. That's you know that's garden variety when people are working for their own interests. There has to be something more insidious. And the idea here is that that people who are your friends, you, that you're sharing your meals with that you are stabbing them in the back, that's the idea of, um, and stabbing them back verbally, meaning that you're not necessarily really working against their interests, um, and you might not even be aware that you're working against their interests, but rather that you are creating a culture where people are um, not um, interested in helping uh, one another. The Hamek um, Dabar, the Nitziv, now we fast forward, another uh, 1,500 years or so to the end of the 19th century. So he says the following. He has, a, um, in, and he has, he, he talks about this in at least two or three places. I'm just going to bring one of them. This Sefer, which in the, um, which we call Sefer Bereshit, so he says in the, um, in the Nevi'im, refer to this as the book of the upright. So it needs to be understood why is this called the, the, the book of the upright. So what's his understanding? So the this is being used to um, explain the Khurban, or sort of to be a, um, a counterpoint to the generation of the destruction of the second Beit HaMikdash, which was a generation, a twisted and um, meandering generation. Perashnu, shahayut sadikim v'chasidim amlei Torah. So the people in the time of Beit Sheni were sadikim, they were righteous, they were generous people, they, um, they were engaged in Torah, but they were not upright in their, the way that they worked. What does that mean? This is a really um, incredible definition of what the uh, of uh, Sinat Chinam is. Basically, the, um, uh, what the Nitziv says, um, and I don't know if necessarily Chazal would agree with him on this, but this is a really a, um, but it's, a, it's a, actually taking the idea of Chazal and putting it onto steroids. The thing that, what does it mean? It means that if people who did not, um, Sinat Chinam refers to people who were, if you didn't if, uh, agree with me, Whereas if I had a different view of what um, of what the Avodat Hashem should be, so um, 
you know, I called you a stuki. I called you an apikoras. I labeled you, right? That's the idea of sinat chinam, labeling of other people and saying, and factionalism. That's the definition of sinat chinam. That eventually led to, and we're going to see that hopefully in, in, in just in a minute, just an example of it, that, that leads to murder. Really such a, uh, a powerful statement. God is yashar. God is the opposite of Dor Ikesh Uf Talto. The we we talk about um, the being uh, the, this this is a term that the Torah uses in Parshat Hazinu, a this crooked generation. But God is Yashar, but God is straightforward, and he cannot tolerate Sadikim, so-called Sadikim, right, of this type. That just the you know, you put it into um, into quotation marks. God doesn't, you know, people who are tzaddikim, they do everything that they can, but what is, they hate other people who don't tow their particular party line. That's the definition of sinat chinam. And now, why then is Sefer Bereshit called Sefer Yisharim? So even though the Avot were, of course, great tzaddikim, that's not um, a question, but that's not what made them the Avot. Od hayu yisharim, they were straightforward. Hainu shehitnagu im aumau ta'olam afilu ovdei elim mechuarim, mikol makom hayu ha'imam ba'ahava v'chashu v'tovatam. Right, that what is Yisharim? They would think about it. Who is Abraham having to deal with? Who does Yitzchak and Yaakov have to deal with? You see it time and time again in the stories in the in the in Breishit. But they treat their uh, the people who are standing against them, and some of them are um, beneath contempt. But nevertheless, they treat them with kavod. They treat them even to use the term of the Nitziv Ba'ahava, but they, I, they had serious ideological differences with these people, but nevertheless, they still treated them with respect. Even in Abraham, Abraham at the, uh, if, you, uh, uh, if you think of the, where Abraham uh, speaks to uh, Melech's dome, so he, um, even though it, it's clear that he's telling the, the, he's telling the king of Stone that I do not accept any of your values, I won't even take um, any of the booty. I won't take even a shoelace from you. But nevertheless, he still saved Stone. He still prayed for Stone. He still speaks to Melech Stone. You can be very clear as to what you what your lines are. And at the same time, be respectful to um, your, uh, even to your opponents. So that's the difference between um, Sefer Yisharim of Sefer Bereshit and the Dor Ikeshuf Taltol of the um, Churban Bayit Sheni. So that is the, um, that's with regard to Sinat Chinam. Now I want to take a, a step back and look at another Gemara. And the other Gemara is a Gemara that uh, many of you are familiar with the story of Kamsa Bar Kamsa. Before we take a look at the version that appears in the Bavli, now here, the way the translation, I originally, I put the two versions one next to the other. We have two versions of this Kamsa Bar Kamsa story. One is the more famous one in uh, the Gemara in uh, Gitin. The other one is in Eicha Raba, um, Eicha Raba being the Medrash on Eicha. It is, according to most scholars, Eicha Rabba was written, or, or compiled might be the better word, compiled around the same time that the Bavli was being compiled in Babel, but Eicha, was being, Eicha Rabba was being compiled in Eretz Yisrael. And you have the following story. Ma'asem, I'm going to take a look, There's a, I put a translation, uh, for those people who want to follow in the translation, um, uh, the translation follows here, um, 
but you can't go down because it's a share screen. Um, okay, so I'm going to um, have to uh, go back and forth. Okay, ma'aseh shaya ba'adam echad b'yerushalayim. So this is, uh, I'm reading on the left side of the screen, the story of a, um, of, uh, there was a man in Yerushalayim, she'asa su'uda, um, he made a, uh, a feast. Amar ben beito, lech v'havei li bar kamtza um, rachme. So he's, now here it's uh, the, um, I put the version of the Ketav Yad, and the, the manuscript, because you can see here that the term Kamtsa, Kamtsa is the name, which we are all familiar with, Kamtsa and Bar Kamtsa, um, and that's in the, uh, the Yerushal, in the, in the Bavli as well. Here we go, Bar Kamtsa. Um, the, what seems to be is that the, um, the name in the original story, because remember, the, or at least possibly was something else, um, Haveli Bar Kamtsa with a kuf, not a kuf, um, and the um, his and the, here we have a Ktaviad Baitele Bar Kamtsra. Okay, in other words, basically it's a it's a much much closer name. I've always um, you know we we say okay the, the the he sent for Kamtsa and he brought Bar Kamtsa. Okay. It's a close name, but you have that word, that bar that's thrown in. The, um, in, the, in this version, it's a much closer fit in terms of the name. It's Kamtsa with a kuf, a kuf, excuse me, and Kamtra, right? So if you're speaking quickly, you can easily make a mistake between Kamtra and Kamtsa. So the, but that may be significant, um, and I'll get back to why in a moment. But in any event, so is it bar Kamtsa with a kuf? Is it Bar Kamtsa with a cuff, whatever it is. Um, Sane, the person that he hate. Al Vyasha ben Arachim. So he is uh, sitting amongst the guests. Al Ashkachai bene Aristaya. So he sees him amongst his, the, the people who are sitting. Amrle, at Sanai va'at yatu begai bete. You are the person that I hate and you're sitting in, in my house. Kum, puk, lech, mi go Right, so just to take a look at the uh, the translation, he said, "Get up and leave my house." So he said, "The answer is, don't shame me, and I'll return you the price of the feast." So he said, "No, you must not recline." Now, this is again the the fact that the term is being used, "don't recline." That uh, there's a certain authenticity there in terms of it, because that is, of course, how the meals were in, uh, in Roman times, the, um, and what we have in the Seder, how you knew that the meal was going to begin by reclining. He said to him, don't shame me, I return you double of what I eat. So he said, don't recline. Don't shame me, I return the cost of this entire banquet. So he said, no, get up and go. Now, the, um, so here I want to take a look at the, um, the, the way that the, 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 um, the, well, we'll continue. Rav Zechariah, the son of Avkilus, was there. So Rav Zechariah, um, the uh, Rav Zechariah ben Avkilus, and this is a name that's going to appear again and again. He was uh, a, a person who was uh, attending at this meal. Rav Zechariah ben Avkilus could have um, could have objected, but he did not object. And the um, and then the person who was insulted, this Barkamsa will call him Miyad Nafikle Avar Benafshe Ilin Misavayin Yatvin Bishavutan Ana Echul Kartsaho. So his response was that the um, the, the people who are reclining and feasting extravagantly, I'm going to go press charges against them, but it sounds more, if you, a better translation might be that they've been, um, they have, they're eating comfortably. I'm going to have them eat uh, things that are not as pleasant. Um, what did he do? So he goes and just to give a, a sense of it, he goes to the, um, the local authorities. He went to the magistrate. 
That's the term that's used here, the magistrate. In the, um, uh, the, the, I, um, here it is, the, um, um, he talks to the shilton, right? He goes to the local Roman authorities, and he says that the korbanot that you send to the Beit HaMikdash, the Jews don't bring. That you, you know, it's basically what is being um, what, what's being described here is that you have a be, the Beit Hamikdash. There were, as we know, um, pagan temples around as well. But the local authorities, the Roman authorities, would um, send uh, sacrifices to the Beit Hamikdash on a regular basis. And this um, Bar Kamsa says the Jews aren't uh, aren't sacrificing them. You should be aware that the Jews are not sacrificing them. And the, um, um, the, there is a back and forth how it's not believed. He says they're sacrificing other animals. He puts a blemish on the animal that's sent. It's not brought as a result. Um, and, the, um, and the final, uh, the, the, um, the bottom line is, Shalach v'amar l'malka, so this, this idea that the Jews are saying is true, that the, um, uh, basically that the, um, our korbanot are not being brought, and, th- and that's what led to the korban of the Beit HaMikdash. So here, had the Briata Amrin ben Kamtsu ben ben Kamtsu Harav Mikdasha because of the story of uh, um, the difference between Kamtsu and Bar Kamtsu, that's what created destroyed the Beit Hamikdash. And the final line is Amar Biosi an Vatol Shavrav Zechariah ben Avkilu Sarfat Echa. What was responsible for the destruction of the Beit Hamikdash? The um, we'll say the modesty of Rav Zechariah ben Avkilus. Now in context, what is the anvatuto shal Rav Zechariah ben Avkilus? The, um, the modesty of Rav Zechariah ben Avkilus was that he was at the meal. He could have stopped something. So basically what this, um, if I take a look at this particular story, I get the, the following idea. I have a direct cause and the direct cause is the fact that you have uh, Jews who are bringing the Roman authorities, that's the Kamp- Bar Kamtsa, who are bringing, who are, who are basically, um, who are basically besmirching the Jewish people in the eyes of the authorities, that's the immediate cause. But the background cause is that there are people who can remedy situations of, call it Sinat Chinam, and don't do it. In other words, the, um, the Chorban here is not being caused by the Sinat Chinam in of itself. The Chorban is being caused by the Zechari ben Avkilos, who presumably has nothing against Bar Kamtsa, who is not being involved in the, um, is not getting himself involved. Now, I'll just, um, uh, I'm going, you know what, I'm not going to do it. I don't have time. So I'm going to, uh, I will tell you this. Uh, I, um, I will uh, forward the, um, the the sheet. Um, I'll try to, to fold it, forward it onto the uh, so that people can download it. If you take a look at the um, uh, the the Josephus, okay, there's a a little bit of a difference here. The in Josephus there is a um, a, a, descri- a description of how indeed in the Beit HaMikdash there was a debate in general about taking non-Jewish korbanot, korbanot from non-Jewish sources, and that there was a very serious faction, and Zechariah ben Avkilos is mentioned in this faction, of, of being people who are opposed to bringing the korbanot. Um, and Josephus says that this is a direct cause for the um, for the attack against the temple, because it um, basically um, saying that the um, that the that this was seen as sedition, this was seen as treason against the Romans um, by not taking the korbanot. So the um, the medrash is working off of a story which has 
um, historical roots, but the Medrash is trying to bring a, across a, a, a deeper, call it moral message from it, that Zechariah ben Avkilus isn't being held to blame because the Korban's not being brought. It's, that's, we'll take, a, we'll take a look at that in the, in the Babli in a moment, where he is brought to, uh, to task for that. But, the, but here it's because he's not stopping the shaming of Bar Kamsa. That's the, the idea. So what we've done here in this particular story is we've taken the Sinat Chinam idea and we have um, gone even beyond what the, the Tziv said. Words, the, we've taken the, the idea of Sinat Chinam from beyond if the original uh, case in the Tosefta was where people love money and they hate their fellow person, meaning that that's what, not what we would call Sinat Chinam at all. Basically, it's looking out for number one. That is the definition of Sinat Chinam in the Tosefta. We take a, a, a step from that to the Babli, and there it is not that we are looking out for number one, but we are in, engaged in, um, in, in gossip, in um, attacks against each other behind people's backs. We go from there to the, um, to the uh, Nitziv, and we talk about factionalism and how people don't have the, um, don't have, uh, the respect for anyone else's opinions other than their own. And now we have this idea that comes across from the story in Eicha Rabba. We have to still take a look in the last 10 minutes at the story in the Babli, but we, the, um, the story in Eicha Rabba, where Bar Kamsa, where the person is, where we are bringing people to task, for their, um, for their uh, not being willing to, um, uh, to stop um, other people from, um, uh, um, from other people from being shamed um, in public. Okay, and Stephen uh, has uh, brought out that, uh, that famous quote uh, in terms of the factions. So thank you for that. So this is the... Um, and so this is the, uh, the idea of, of where we reach when we now take a look at the Gemara in Gitin and see how they take this, the Kamta story. Now, I want to come back, hopefully, just to mention, remember the spelling. I, I mentioned the spelling before, and you might have thought, why is he going into that? Who cares what their names were, whether it's Kamta, Kamtra, Kamta, Bar Kamta. I think that it's significant. Bear with me. Hopefully, that will be the the punchline for this year. So now we have the the Gemara in Gittin, and the Gemara in Gittin says the following: There's a preface to the story, and this preface to the story is um, is when I at least what I've been taught this Gemara, and when I've heard people hearing it speaking about the Gemara, this is glossed over. But I think that it is the key to the Gemara. And here is the, is the line: Amar of Yochanan. Rabbi Yochanan said, "My dichtiv, Ashrei Adam mefached tamid umakshel ibo yipol vira'a." What does that mean? Right? There's a pasuk, the pasuk in Mishlei. The pasuk in Mishlei says, "Happy is the man who is constantly afraid, and the one who hardens his heart will evil will befall him." And then, without explaining. The Gemara goes right into the uh, Kamsa Bar Kamsa story, saying, along with two other stories, which we're not going to talk about, that a Kamsa u Bar Kamsa Charuv Yerushalayim. So the Yerushalayim was destroyed because of Kamsa Bar Kamsa. How so? Dahu Gavra Dirachme Kamsa u Bal Bar Kamsa. Right? So, okay, the same story except in terms of the, uh, the invitation, there's a mix-up. Bar Kamsa is invited and not um, uh, Kamsa. Again, some slight variations as to how much Bar Kamsa is willing to pay. Bottom line is he's thrown out. Okay? The, there's no mention of Zechariah ben Afkulos. That doesn't appear in the Babli. But we have the following in the second paragraph. 
So here, he's physically removed. The person takes him by the scruff of his neck and throws him out the door. Amar, Here, it's now the people who are not, um, who are not, uh, who are, who are not objecting, are not a specific Rav, not a specific person, but are the um, Chachamim in general. So it's clear that they are okay with this kind of behavior. So I'm going to have, bring the wrath of the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the king against them. And he goes not to the Shilton, but he goes to the Kesar. And in this version, he goes all the way to Rome. And he says that the Jews are rebelling. The Jews are rebelling. And then he, the story that he sends a korban with a blemish. And the blemish is not something which is a significant blemish in Roman ritual law, but is a significant blemish in our, um, in our eyes. And the Gemara doesn't um, and now the Kohanim are in a bind. And what do they say? Right? The Chachamim want to bring it in order to, um, to basically say, no, we're going to, we need to have peace. Right? We, this will cause trouble with the authorities. We will bring the, uh, the Korban. Amar Luhu, Rabbi Zechariah ben Avkilus, Yomru Balei Mumin Krivin Lagabe Mizbeach. So then, this, here comes Zechariah ben Avkilus, not as a person who was at the meal, but rather as a person who um, is in the Mikdash. He's a, perhaps he's the Kohen. He's refusing to allow for this Korban to be brought. That um, goes really strikes very strongly at what was going on. The, um, the, the Prushim, the leading Chachamim, were the ones who said, we should, we should bring these korbanot, according to Josephus, whereas it was the uh, Kanaim who said that they, they should not. And one of the leading Kanaim, in a different uh, passage in Josephus, is indeed Zechariah, the son of Phalic or Ufkilos in, uh, in Greek. In other words, the, this, uh, the Zechariah ben Avkilos, who is not referred to in Chazal elsewhere, except for one other place, which I, which is, I don't know if I'll reach today, but that basically the Zechariah ben Avkilos is one of the Kanaim. And he is in the Mikdash. He doesn't want this to be brought, but it's being brought, it's being stated here as a um, halachic argument. Okay? The, um, the, uh, and so here, he, um, the, the Jews rebelled against you, um, and the Chachamim want to bring it. So we'll take a look at the, uh, the, the translation for the last few minutes. Um, so here, uh, the sages said, if we do sacri- not sacrifice, then we must prevent Bar Kamtza from reporting this to the emperor. So now the Chachamim say, okay, you don't want to bring this because you're going to say people are going to say what they say? Okay, if that's the case, then we have to stop Bar Kamtza so he doesn't go back. So Rabbi Zechariah said to them, if you kill him, people will say that one who makes a blemish on, uh, on Behemoth in the Mikdash, he's supposed to be killed. So as a result, they did nothing. So Bar Kamsa's slander was accepted by the authorities and constantly, the, the, consequently the war between the Jews and the Romans began. As I said, Josephus says the same thing, that one of the major uh, direct causes for the Roman um, reconquest or of, of Jerusalem, or the, I might say reconquest might be the wrong term, but rather the uh, the violent um, taking of the uh, of Yerushalayim um, and the destruction of the Beit Hamikdash was because their korbanot weren't being accepted. That was the direct cause. But now I want to get back to Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Yochanan says in the Gemara, right? You can see it here in the English. Rabbi Yochanan says 
The excessive humility of Rav Zechariah ben Avkilos destroyed our temple, burned our sanctuary, and exiled us from our land. Right in the the original text of the Gemara, Amar Rav Yochanan Anavuto shall Rabbi Akiva shall Rabbi Zechariah ben Avkilos hechriva et beitenu sarfat hechalenu vehiglitanu me artsenu. Now this Rav Yochanan, remember, is the same as the previous of Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Yochanan was the one who started the Gemara. But, okay, I apologize, it should be in green. The, um, Rabbi Yochanan was the, um, was the one who said here that the idea is, Ashrei Adam Efachei Tamid Umakshali Bo Yipol Bira'a. Someone who is constantly afraid, and, but he, if he hardens his heart, he will, evil will befall him. What is Rabbi Yochanan saying here? It's the humility of Rabbi Zechariah ben Avkilus that destroyed our home. Now, the, when it was said here, right across in the... Um, in, in, the, uh, in, in the Medrash. So that was referring to Rav, uh, Rav Zechariah ben Avkilos, who would not object to the, um, to the embarrassment of Bar Kamtsa at the feast. Rav Zechariah ben Avkilos in the Babli wasn't at the feast. He was in the Mikdash. He was the one who doesn't want to allow for the Korban to be brought. In each case, what is he saying? He's saying that the, um, in, uh, in, in the, in the, in the Babli, what he's saying is that what will people say? People will say that blemish animals may be sacrificed on the altar. People will say, right, uh, that one who makes a blemish on a sacrificial animal is to be killed. In other words, that, in other words we can't act because we don't want people to say or, or come to the wrong conclusions. The Anavuto Shel Rabbi Zachary ben Avkilus here is being, isn't even an impact of Sinat Chinam directly. That's not the, the sin of Zachary ben Avkilus. I don't even know if we call it a sin. The moral failing of Rabbi Zachary ben Avkilus is his inability to take action when action needs to be taken. Whereas here, there is a crisis. We have a, a moment where, the, um, where everything hangs in the balance. And you have what the Gemara, I think, is saying is that everything for a Chorban is in place. You have all of the failings of Kamtsa, you have the failings of Bar Kamtsa, you have the failings of the people around you, you have all the Sinat Chinam around you, and the only person standing in the way is Rav Zechariah ben Avkilus. The only person who can stop all of this is Zechariah ben Avkilus. And all he has to do is to say, bring the korba or kill Bar Kamtsa, take action. And he doesn't. Why? Because he's afraid. That was the pasuk that we said originally. On the one end, you say, Ashrei ha'ish, Ashrei adam, excuse me, mifachei tamid, umakshe bo yipol bira'a. If you are, if you take caution, you're happy. That's mifachei tamid. But if you're makshe bo, if you harden your heart, if you allow your caution to paralyze you, that will lead to destruction. That's Yipol Bira. That's the idea. So Rabbi Yochanan is saying that with everything going on, it still could have been stopped because it's because of Zechariah ben Avkilus's inaction. That is, and that's what he's calling Anavonuto, his, um, his meekness, his saying, I'm not good enough to make the, uh, uh, you know, I'm not wise enough to make this kind of decision. My shoulders aren't broad enough. That's what leads to the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash.
that everything comes because of that, the, or he could have prevented it all. It's interesting that the Gemara says no, or I shouldn't say the Gemara. Rabbi Eliezer, who is a Talmud of Rabbi Elchanan, he disagrees with his, his Rebbe. He says, Bo ure'e kama gedola kocha shel busha, shaharei siya kadosh baruch hu et bar kamtza vehichriv et beito v'sara v'hechala. Take a look at how great is the busha, if you will, that's the um, corollary for the sinat um, chinam, because it's, it's with that that HaKadosh Baruch Hu aids Bar Kamsa to destroy the Beit HaMikdash. And what I would like to close with is the name Kamsa, because Kamsa, interestingly enough, means grasshopper in uh, Aramaic. Um, and I think that the name might have been deliberately changed to Kamsa from its original term because of these psukim in Yoel. Yoel wants to talk about the nature of destruction. And what does Yoel say is that Yeter Agezem Achal Ha'arbe, Yeter Ha'arbe Achal Ha'yelek, Yeter Ha'yelek Achal Ha'chasim. Everything is destroyed and consumed by the grasshoppers. And what the grasshoppers are, right, we, we, even today, there's a, um, a plague of locusts which is going on. We, we're so concerned about corona, we're not even paying attention to it. But in East Africa right now, so there's a, a, a modern day plague of locusts. But what's the idea of a locust? Each locust is tiny, doesn't eat very much, but it's a, a syndrome that devours everything. You take a look at each particular kamtsa, you take a look at every particular grasshopper, and you don't think of it as being necessarily as such a threat. But I think that the Gemara, by using this name of Bar Kamtsa, is trying to say that the Busha of Bar Kamtsa, the Sinat Chinam of Bar Kamtsa, this idea, these are things that we don't take too seriously in our day-to-day -day running of things, but when they add up, they add up to Churban. So you hear at some different uh, definitions of what Sinat Chinam are, different understandings of what may have led to the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash. So all I could say is that Bezrat Hashem, as we lead up to, to Tisha B'Av a week from now, that hopefully, maybe you know, 2,000 years later, we finally are learning the lessons and that we are uh, able to turn the, uh, the tide and uh, bring back the Geula, and that the steps of Geula that we've already been uh, witness to uh, in our lifetime, so should only go and uh, continue. So uh, Shabbat Shalom, and uh, have a, a good summer from, from this point on. I look forward to, to seeing you, hopefully in the flesh, but if not on Zoom, uh, come September.